California's fire protection problems are unique among the 50 states and probably among the worst in the world. It is the most populous state in the union with a network of freeways and secondary roads affording easy access to most wildland areas. It has the widest variety of topography. Nearly any terrain in the world, from the glacial slopes of the Himalayas to the blistering Sahara dunes can be duplicated in California at some season of the year. Heavy winter rain and spring snowmelt foster a heavy growth of wild ground cover. Then, abruptly, come months of much sunshine and little moisture. Vegetation dries to the consistency of gunpowder, and the fire season is upon us. The hazard is further augmented, usually in September, by strong drying winds. The problem is particularly acute in Southern California, where the Santa Anas blast in from the Northeast in three or four day cycles. Velocities may reach up to 70 miles per hour, and any spark is a potential holocaust. Small wonder that wildland fire protection agencies statewide respond to more than 40,000 alarms a year. In 1910, Roosevelt was out of office, succeeded by President William H. Taft. Opponents of Roosevelt's and Pinchot's conservation efforts wielded great influence in Congress. They moved quickly to cut off funding to the fledgling Forest Service. The Speaker of the House, Joe Cannon, said not one cent for scenery. So there was a huge culture war going on. Pinchot and new Secretary of Interior Richard Ballinger disagreed publicly on forest policy. Pinchot, pushing his limits, arranged for a letter to be read in Congress criticizing the president for misinterpreting Ballinger's policies. This was the final straw for President Taft. He fired Pinchot for insubordination. Well, it should have been a debate about policy. What's the best way to manage fire and protect these lands and communities from fire? Got sidetracked into a battle about politics. Whose view of land management and the role of government will prevail? So the fire thing wasn't finally about fire. It becomes, it's remade into a polarizing political spectrum. You're either with Ballinger or you're with Pinchot. You're either with limited government and land management or you're with very active government and wholesale commitment to it. You're either with sort of folk knowledge and the Indian way of, of burning the landscape or you're with professional forestry and the kind of academic heft that that brings with it. You're forced to choose, and that was, well, that's very effective politics. It forces people to choose, but it doesn't make good policy because there were really a whole array of things. And there were probably different choices that were necessary for different regions. They named him Little Smokey. Anne and a special Piper Cub plane took him on another trip by air. This time it was clear across the country, over America's farms, factories, and cities. Finally, Little Smokey and his plane landed in Washington, our nation's capital. Here, along with his official escort, New Mexico's assistant state game warden, Homer C. Pickens, Little Smokey was greeted in the rain by a very enthusiastic committee. The fight against fire is a never-ending fight. Each year, thousands of lives are sacrificed, and millions of dollars worth of property go up in smoke. The tragedy is that most fires are preventable that human carelessness accounts for most of them. Preventing fire is everyone's job. But the control and extinguishing of fires, once started, is the responsibility of the fire department. To this end, modern apparatus and equipment play an important part when manned by efficient, well-trained crews. 